looking down. Here we go. Yeah. We look great. <laughs> and Mitzi, here you go. Mitzi gets a treat. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, as I promised you all, I would have a very distinct line of demarcation between my energy work and meditation work and our talking about um, Black Lives Matter and, you know, issues of human rights and human dignity. So this is a human rights, human dignity, and the first of our Voices of Freedom series. And who better to start it off with than my amazing mother, Ursie Potter. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you guys, uh, a lot of you say to me things like, Benita, you're so lucky. You had the best upbringing ever. Um, you know, how do you have such awareness or insight into politics, which honestly, I don't think I really do, but I do have a great comfort in speaking out. And that is all thanks to uh, this woman here. <laughs> so um, I wanted to ask my mom because I was raised marching in protest marches in DC, uh, Vietnam War, uh, human rights, freedom, um, you know, cleaning the planet. Um, we were there at the first Earth Day. And I'd like to start with that one, Mom, because that's so beautiful. The first Earth Day was a week right? Uh, no, it was three days. Three days. But but what things were happening, like the queer water sloop came down from the Hudson, and that was part of it. Mm -hmm. um, the big uh, celebration on the mall was one day, a lot of singing <laughs> mm -hmm. with very... Uh, very devoted singers oh yeah 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 it was huge people came from like all over the world really mm -hmm. to be here in dc for the first earth day here let's get this a little closer to you um so yeah yeah and we had a lot of people staying at our house our house was Packed. We had people yeah. camping in the yeah. yard. <laughs> like, yeah. Used the neighbors. <laughs> yeah, we filled the neighborhood, everyone's spare yeah. bedroom. I remember hammocks, people sleeping in hammocks slung from the trees. Um, it, it was packed. Um, and one of the reasons that I see er the first Earth Day as a political rally as opposed to you know, these days, every year on Earth Day, Disney puts out a movie on, you know, the wonders of nature and things like that. But I see it more as political because it started in the rise of the Vietnam War protests. Yeah, the big mob was just before it. Tell us about the big mob. Oh, that was uh, people coming together, being upset at the craziness of the Vietnam War and it was a big mob mobilization and the big mobilization. Well it's called the big mob. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it was uh so people were very aware. They're very concerned. And uh that war was just going to go on forever, killing too many people. And I recall the first person I heard speak against the Vietnam War was Coretta Scott King. Not Martin Luther King, it was Coretta Scott King, who said, this is the white man selling, sending the black man to murder the yellow man. And that was first a big shock to all of us because um, we were unaware 
we were all marching soldiers. And you started to think about it at my church. We discussed it. And we realized, we realized she was right. Yeah. <laughs> and that was a tremendous awareness. Wow. You know, yeah. history has sort of negated the extraordinary work Coretta Scott King did. No, it was so it, it was more negated than we we had a pretty close society. Uh, and her as as I recall her parents had a paper mill or something and it got burned down because he was too um he was doing too well and that's the way things were then yeah it's <laughs> not much different now that's the shocking thing that's yeah. the shocking thing because you know once i realized i had to do something about it and you just assume everyone would do something about it and correct it. And no. <laughs> Again, not much different now, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. But from then to now, like when I was re we were reading the newspaper today, mm -hmm. 16 nonstop days of protest. Mm -hmm. And we were trying to think, when is the last time we saw 16 nonstop days of protest? And it was the civil rights and the Vietnam War. Yeah. Like yeah. those issues combined. Yes. The uh, Quakers in particular formed in Lafayette Park. They were <laughs> there day and night for years. Uh, and uh, and so, yeah. <laughs> I remember, I remember people would go to keep them company oh, because yeah. it was 24-7. Yeah. They had people yeah. there with signs facing the White House. Yeah, for years. Yeah. And that was back in the days when you could go on White House grounds and have picnics and stuff. Or had that stopped then? No, I, I don't remember. I, when, yeah. Yeah, I, I recall when I was a little I, I kid, you were allowed why. to, the White House grounds was considered park land, public land. Well, the White House itself, no. I think I will have to Google that yeah. and see because I don't know. Yeah, we've seen over the years, the White House beca has become more of a fortress keeping people mm -hmm. out as opposed to the people's property. Um, I recall, okay, so I got to let everyone know, we went to a lot of protest marches and we went to a lot of like uh, folk protest singing events mm -hmm. all around the area. My recollection was it, these were really integrated and people wearing beautiful, bright colored, creative outfits <laughs> and everyone side <laughs> by side like there there was um, among these groups there was <laughs> mitzi my, my best friend not the dog <laughs> my best friend mitzi and i would go to all of them and we always dressed very middle class always we always wear skirts and we we wanted to show <laughs> that, that it was everybody, not not just hippies. <laughs> yeah, but you made these amazing batik banners, and everyone would. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that would require to, several people to carry them. Yeah. And people would be thrilled to come forward and ask to well, help that, carry that the banner. That was big move. What was the banner? It was batik guys, so you can see through it both yeah, ways, I, and no, it's. Uh, Virginians for peace. That was the big mob against the Vietnam War. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yes. Now, um, there were a lot of like um, offshoots to the protests then. 
like um, events. It seemed like every time there was any public event, there would be areas where people were speaking out. Oh yeah, yeah, that was that was in DC. Yeah. yeah, yeah, a lot going on. Yeah, like the Fourth of July festival, yeah. there would be people there and, speaking out. And the cathedral, the Washington Cathedral, had on Earth Day and at the time of the Big Mo, they had concerts speaking out. Pete Seeger sang, sang in the cathedral. The National Cathedral. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. I remember us going and seeing Pete singing at the National Cathedral. Um, at I remember in at formal buildings, yeah. at formal buildings on the National Mall, and then in like church basements. Mm -hmm. And uh, we saw Peggy Seeger singing in a health food store, and like in the little cafe area. Like there, there was no thought of we're so big and famous we don't do small venues. They oh. were. Everywhere. Oh, no, of course. <laughs> they, <laughs> no, they they were never too big. They were <laughs> of the people. Mm. Always. Always. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And oh. and Mike Seeker, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Pete Peggy and Mike and um yeah. And it was always like fully integrated with all kinds of people. Mm -hmm. There was no thought of how much money you earned or what color your skin was. Everyone was well, welcome. They weren't earning much. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, people who earned money were yeah. also invited to come. Yeah. 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 Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about the marches that we went to when I was a kid because there was a change in ambiance, you know, in atmosphere over the years. Uh, I mean, there were times when there was like peaceful protests and there were times where like the death count had gone too high and the corruption was too obvious and we were really angry. And there were times when we were like, make, like, do you have any recollection of like the atmosphere of the marches? We're seeing. Oh, it was, I only remember peaceful. Mm -hmm. It was always peaceful. Yeah. The marches were always peaceful, but like you remember when you took when you went to see Hair on Broadway, mm -hmm. and the first time you went to see it, you told me it was very peaceful, and then the second time you went to see it, when they sang "Let the Sunshine In." No, no, that was oh God, Ronnie and Kit, your elder sister and brother, um, to see Hair. They were little kids. And it was the last time that I was playing here in Washington, mm -hmm. just like the last performance before it closed. And I had to take my children to hear this. I was and too young. You were too young. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they wouldn't let you in. <laughs> anyway, and yeah, they say it was their last performance, and they did. They sang with a kapow, you know, let the sun shine in. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I recall, like, when the show first started on Broadway, let the sun shine in was about, like, opening yourself up to the sun. But then there was some mobilization in Vietnam, and mm -hmm. there was um, just, like, so much killing, so much death. That by the time they closed, it was very um, angry and demanding. Well, well, that that was when Richard Nixon came in, and uh, and upped things, and it was basically a few a few centers, one of whom. See, one was from Oregon and the other was from Texas. That's when Texas had great uh, politicians. <laughs> <laughs> and they were the ones that stopped the funding for the war. Mm. The things have. 
everything keeps turning topsy turvy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did a live stream earlier um, mentioning about uh, Cheney and Halliburton mm -hmm. needing to like bring funding to the U.S. by you know mm -hmm. increasing what we sell to increase war in the world. Um, so let's see. I'm, I should have written down <laughs> notes because you guys, my mom and I, we've been talking about this, you know, with what's happening now, like now with um, in the Black Lives Matter people dancing and crumping to the police and mm -hmm. the, the group that started who invented crumping in response to the riots following the Rodney King murder, like I didn't know, I mean, I, I'm and I didn't know that crumping was a style of getting out the pain from all of that and the anger. It was an emotional response dance style. So it is amazing now to see. God, I can be so naive, just off in my own little corner, that I miss like major details like that. So to now see entire groups crumping to the police in the <clears throat> current protests and the. Um, you know, Trump puts up that that ridiculous wall all around the three parks surrounding. Oh, we instantly the... saw it as an opportunity to put artwork up. Exactly, <laughs> but then he sent his private police over to take down the artwork. So people were going ahead, taking down the artwork and putting it all over D.C. You, know, so... you, you can't. You know, I should say. Bonita was a tiny little sprout. We were living in, Bonita was born in Munich, Germany. We were working for the US government and this crazy Vietnam War started <coughs> and came home. And I said to my father, what is this war about? Why, <coughs> why, uh, I can think of it. Yes. anyway. What is it about? And my father said, and my father was brilliant, but I didn't know it. It was just my father. And dad said at the beginning of the Vietnam War, this is a people's war. You cannot win against the people's war. We're going to fight it for years and we are going to lose. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to get out. The French should have gotten out, and then the Americans should not have been Francophiles and got in. And so, so I got from my father, oh, this is the people's war. We will not win. So I come to Washington and speak to a neighbor who works for the government. And I said, do you understand this war? And he said, oh. We have to be there. We have to fight. It was, um, of course, we have to fight. The, we should have gone into China, but we didn't. So now we have to go into Vietnam. And I went, oh my God, my father's right. They're all crazy. <laughs> and what was it that my grandfather Nat said about war? Oh, well, he told me when I was a little child that all wars are unnecessary. We have wars because men want them. And mm. since I never heard that before, and he went over every single war and showed me if we hadn't gone to war, what, how it would have been resolved a different way. Yeah. yeah, that and, there is always a solution other than war. War is just like, men won. yeah. And you know, I can't realize he was right <laughs> again. There is yeah. always a better path than war. There's always a better path than, you know, oppression and destruction. <laughs> There's always a bet, you know, what is the better path and why don't we follow it? Yeah. How do we follow it? That's how you raised me to think. 
Yeah, thank you. I'm not a good at tennis. Yeah. We've been in one more after another. <laughs> well, here's one some crazy more after another. <laughs> oh. So you're getting a lot of happy birthdays, you guys. <laughs> yesterday was my mom's birthday. People asking how old you are. <laughs> And, and I, my answer is, it's none of your goddamn business. <laughs> <laughs> I won't ask you how old you are. Old enough to be my mom. That's what I always say. <laughs> but... <laughs> Oh, old enough to learn a few things. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'll tell you, when, <laughs> when I was growing up, we had, I, I mean, you guys, like, I was so bad. My parents had a lot of dinner parties, and yeah. whenever there were protests and stuff, like, we had people staying here all the time. Um, and I used to hide in the corner and listen to what they were saying. And I recalled a few things. One, conversations here were always or usually very respectful. Like even if people had differing opinions, I recall like a lot of discussion about these opinions, were they uh, like just what you were raised to believe or were they mm -hmm. research? People would listen with an open mind because there was thought of how do we find the best future for everyone? Yeah, this is our friends. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I mean, we had government workers for friends. There were, yeah. you know, there were pro Nixon, pro war people no. that, no? Okay. No, I didn't have <laughs> any pro Nixon uh -huh. ever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> try, try that again. <laughs> I'm backing away. <laughs> but I do recall the amount of respect and what I yeah. look back at now and go, God, how naive we were because like there is a thought of if people understood how to thrive as a total community, then they would make that choice and <laughs> yeah. And we're st and we're in this mess now because there are people who think they will only thrive if someone else is being oppressed. Oh. Yeah. Um that in order for me to have, I need to take from someone. And I don't well, you know, it's it's much more complex than that. It's it's the fact that and Trump, I'm from New York, so I've known what I can't what word can I use? <laughs> a lot of years. A lot of years. I think back in the eighties he decided he wanted to run for president. <laughs> and he he was doing destruction in New York oh, for thirty years before and his father before him. Um, and so he learned to thrive. It has to be, it's for him, it had to be at someone else's expense. And if you listen to him, it's always at someone else's expense. Unfortunately, it's again your and my expense in the end. Uh -huh. Our country is going down the train hall, but um, it's <laughs> I don't know where, where I started with that. <laughs> um, but the, it was it's me against them uh -huh. always, and while he always hired refugees who immigrants. At very, 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 very low wages. He started this wall thing because he's trying to cater to the insecure people. And, and um, well, none of it has anything to do with what he believes. What he believes is what he wants. That's true. And a lot of people he hired, he did not pay. So yeah yeah so um 
You know, I got to say, my memories of my childhood were of you always teaching me to speak my voice and to have a respect. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and to be respectful to other people's yeah. beliefs, that all beliefs should be open-minded and yeah. towards the greater sense of good. Well, I think people were in their way polite, like we mentioned back, back then, <clears throat> until it became a Christian right weapon. Uh, religion was not polite conversation. You know, you had your religion. I had mine. We didn't talk about it. We respected mm -hmm. one another's right to their own religion. And but religion has become politicized mm -hmm. and um so it's sort of in the forefront. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's true. Um well that's <laughs> Yeah, that's it. I just wanted you guys to meet my mom. <laughs> and you guys... Um, Troublemaking to the end. Yeah. So yeah. later this week on Wednesday, I'm going to talk yeah. with... Are you leaving? <laughs> okay, you're going to be on the clip. <laughs> um, on Wednesday, I'm going to meet with Mariam Sardari, who... Um, came to this country to be able to pursue personal freedom and um, has brought a lot to offer to this country. Uh, she has not always received back what she, um, you know, so we're, we're going to talk a little bit about Virginia laws and how um, immigrant families are treated in Virginia. Um, as well as when people do come to this country, what are they coming here for? What are they coming here from? Um, and then on Saturday morning, 8 a.m., I'm going to talk with Will Harris of Willpower. And uh, he's a self-made African-American fellow, very, very dear friend. And he is a completely self-made fellow who has said, I need to give back to my community. He has set up programs all over the world uh, to help people go after their personal empowerment. He goes into countries where there's a lot of impoverishment. He works with orphans. Um, and he said to me, the one country he really cannot... Um, bring his work to is the United States because he goes to other countries and the money he makes here in the U.S. is again real self-made but very successful. The money he makes he can set up entire orphanages, entire schools, entire like huge programs that help communities and he can do it quickly and effectively but then he comes here and between all the bureaucracy and the expense it would be, he can't get anywhere near that level of goodness done. So we're going to talk about uh, how his philanthropic work impacts like hundreds of thousands of people in just a few years from, I remember when he was thinking about this idea and now just a few years later, he is a global sensation for, for helping those who need help and why it is that his work is not able to happen in the U.S. Uh, we'll continue with our Voices of Freedom, and uh, we will continue with giving you all definitions of what is happening, as we've done already, uh, racism versus white privilege, what, what are they, what's the difference, and how we're going to have more discussions on how to elevate white fragility into interconnected human empowerment Again, I spoke this morning about uh, what does it mean to um, uh, to defund the police and why would people be crying for this? So uh, thank you all. Thank you. And I hope you have a wonderful day. If you have any questions, feel welcome to type them in the comments. My mom and I can um, answer them later. Thanks. Bye.